wrong, wrong direction. Okay, yeah, this, this paper is uh, joint work with Linda Schilling, who is actually the lead author on the paper, and Jesus Fernandez Villaverde. Uh, you know, Linda is very busy already having presented paper and, you know, being in the panel discussion, so therefore I get to present this paper, so, but uh, bear with me then. All right, so this is about central bank digital currency when price and bank stability collide. The paper has been circulating for a while, but if you have seen it before, it keeps on changing. And I hope there will be some new lessons here also. All right. So we already talked a lot about central bank digital currency. No need for me to introduce the issue. Um, the paper is motivated by the disintermediation threat. And this is something that I know that banks are very concerned about. Um, so if households hold CBDC accounts, you know, they might find them sufficiently attractive. Then why go and hold bank accounts, right? That's a, that's a real challenge. Now, there are a couple of ways of thinking about this. Um, one is, um, you know, that no, no worry, we just make the CBDC sufficiently unattractive, right? We just only allow you to hold small balances, don't pay interest on it, and so forth. I mean, these are sort of design features that, say, the, the Fed is arguing they should do. Um, you know, you could also have uh, essentially the point that Rod Garrett uh, stressed in his talk and that, that, that also David on the Fathers in this paper and Jonathan and I associated with Duffy because he gave this in, in, in defense of doing this in, in Congress. So there are statements that essentially CBDC just put a fire under the behinds of the banks and make them, you know, not sit on their large profits and give more surplus to consumers, essentially by forcing them to reinvest the CBDC at the banks and then just keep the funding, keep the deposit base this way. It's just more, more expensive. That's a possibility. But it's also possible, <clears throat> and that's what I want to think through, that indeed, uh, especially younger households, you know, don't bother with bank deposits anymore. Maybe bank deposits are more attractive, but, you know, landlines are also attractive. But if you ask younger people whether they have a landline, they stare at you blankly and they point to this thing, right? They're just, you know, you, you, you know they, they, may be, they may be coming, you know, part of history. So who knows? I don't know what's going to take place. I'm not arguing it's going to be one of the three, but at least a third option of the disintermediation needs to be thought through more cleanly. Okay, so if the disintermediation happens, the question then happens, what happens to the asset side of the central bank? So one uh, proposal by, you know, that I associated with the Brunemeyer Niepelt, and that I think the gentleman that was sitting here, but I think he's now gone from the, uh, from the audience in the middle, never mind, sort of asked, well, what about the, if the central bank just then goes and refunds the bank? Essentially, you know, you're replacing the deposits that banks hold, which are a stable funding base, by, uh, by bonds issued by the banks, and then, uh, then all goes well and, and is good. Okay, so I want, to, I want to think about that scenario, and I want to think that scenario all the way to the end. And I want to make this as simple as possible. So the only thing that's here is funding of firms through the, through the household deposit base, if you like. I mean, there's much more going on in the economy, abstract from all this. In fact, I'm going to make life even more dramatically simple by reducing this whole, you know, financial infrastructure and so forth, going from the bonds to the banks, from the banks to the loans to the firms and so forth. I'm just going to consolidate it all, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that the central bank runs all these projects. Now, I don't mean that the central bank is going to run the economy, and that will be a disaster, right? But for the purpose of the paper, that's, a, that's sufficient as an abstraction. We know enough about the plumbing there that, that we can just, that I think for the purpose of the paper, can just abstract from it, right? So it's not about the central banks running the, the, the world, it's, it's about the central bank getting into the intermediation business. In, in at least an indirect fashion, because once the, once the central bank holds you know, private sector assets, maybe more massively than with quantitative easing, it gets into the whole issue of maturity transformation. It gets, you know, basically, it, it imports the financial instability issues that are there in the banking system to begin with. And so that's what we want to think about. You might think that, you know, having banks you know, give long-term loans and being funded with short-term deposits creates financial instability through bank runs. So that's what Diamond Dipvik have argued. Once you go to central banks, you know, no problem anymore because now it's a central bank. There couldn't be possibly be a run on the central bank. We argue that that's not so. The same problem just, you know, resurfaced, but in a different guise. Okay. So <clears throat> in our model, we only have households. Uh, yeah. Who will do uh, uh, credit intermediation? Pardon? Who will do credit intermediation? Who will select the winners? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying I'm just abstracting from all that. I mean, that's still going on in the background, you know. I'm just going to put this all on the central bank asset side. Um, you know, that's a, we're not reinventing the wheel on that one. I mean, you, you want some papers. I mean, we could do this. I don't think it would add anything to the analysis. Okay. So here we only now, right, and that's sort of to Gould's question, we only have household, the central bank projects and the projects, you know, there's no problem about the, with the projects indeed. And the central bank is a financial intermediary to the entire economy. And that's just to make it super simple, nothing else. I mean, we're not saying that, that that's what's going to happen, but sort of, you know, reduces the mechanism to the essence. Okay, so the key mechanism is now that we're going to have that we have to do with the, with the maturity transformation. Diamond Dipic is the benchmark model for doing that, so we think about this. But now it's going to be a nominal version of the model. So the liabilities of the central bank are nominal. And then therefore, if you go to the central bank and say, I want my 50 euros, I'm, I'm running on you. They're just giving you five, 10 euro notes, right? And so there's, uh, there's no obligation there. So what does a run on the central bank mean? A run on the central bank is running away from cash, the same way that a deposit run is a run away from deposits. So in a standard bank run, people run away from deposit into something else, usually cash. Here on the central bank, they run away from cash into what? The only thing that remains are goods. So it's a spending run. Right, so run on goods is a run away from cash, and that's how I want you to think about it. Now, bank, central banks have three competing objectives, right? There's a traditional price stability objective and trying to master three and the dual mandate and so forth, long literature on that. We also want efficiency, uh, risk sharing, and we want to, you know, make sure that there are no runs. We don't uh, like, you know, suddenly people running away and, and being in panic and buying stuff. So we want trust that the monetary system holds. Our key result is that we're going to have a CBDC trilemma. So of the three objectives between price stability, monetary trust, and efficiency, the central bank can only achieve two of them. But then we have sort of, you know, there's a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. So we recently had a discussion. We said, ah, you know, these resolutions are more interesting. So maybe they're about CBDC design. And maybe that's a way of thinking about it. Okay. So here's my literature slide, uh, hopelessly outdated. And uh, I, I see lots of people in the audience where I'm insulting with this literature slide, so I better just move on. Okay. Right. So the, the real model portion is diamond dip fix. So you, you, you have seen this many times. So let me just do a brief recap just to set the stage. There are three periods. There are lots of agents. They are in, in period zero. They have some goods. They, don't, they want to consume in period one or period two. How do, they, how do they do this? Well, the goods can be invested in some uh, long-term asset, and that's the only thing that we really need here. So there's a long-term asset that, that returns our units of goods in period two, unless it's liquidated in period one, upon which it just delivers one unit of the good. So that's a long-term real storage technology there. Agents in period zero don't know whether they want to consume period zero or one. With probability lambda, they like to consume in period one, and with probability one minus lambda, they like to consume in period two. So now, um, now you have to, you want to, nonetheless, maximize ex ante expected utility. So that's given by the, by the objective here on the left on that equation, subject to the resource constraint of how many resources you give to people, how many x one you give to people in period one, how much you give to them in period two. You maximize this, and if this risk aversion is uh, greater than one. What results is that x1 star is bigger than 1. So that's a classic result in diamond dipic. I like to think of that as the impatient agents essentially eating a bit more than what they, what they, you know, what you could do with the resource they invested. And that's sort of the, and, and that's, that creates a dilemma. If suddenly everybody comes and says, I'm impatient, right, then the, then uh, the resources and the long-term technology won't be enough to pay them off. And that, that's a source of the financial instability in the bank run. Okay, so now we're going to have a nominal model, so that's layered on top of that. So that's, um, you know, there are nominal models out there, but that's our version here. So central bank policy is now triple, and it's M, that's just a number. It's Y, which is a function from uh, lambda, from the intra lambda, one, or zero 01 to zero 01, let's say. And there's I, which is a mapping from zero 01 to uh, minus 1 to infinity. And Y is the uh, central bank liquidation policy, and I is the normal interest rate policy. So let's, let me explain you the timing here. So in period zero, agents go to the central bank, they give the, give the goods, and they get M units of CBDC. And the, CB, the central bank invests all the real goods in the project. Again, you know, there's all this plumbing in the background that we abstract from here. 
The period one agents learn their type, the impatient agents spend their money. So, um, we are not saying withdrawal because you know, there's no withdrawal anymore. CBDC is money. The patient agents may do so, and there's going to be a fraction of agents between Lambda and one that decide to do so. The inpatient agent certainly will, but the patient agent might. So, you know, Central Bank observes the aggregate spending fraction, and you can think that that's particularly easy if Central Bank digital currency is, a, is, a, is an account with the Central Bank, then they observe everything. Uh, but even if it's token, maybe they have enough, you know, observations to uh, to see this. So therefore, the central bank then liquidates a certain fraction of its long-term projects in order to, to satisfy these shopping demands, depending on the fraction of agents that now go shopping, right? And it's a fraction of agents that goes shopping in period one. And then there's a market claim price, and then the remaining agents spend, uh, you know, the remaining balances you know, including interest in period two, and, and the central bank sells the remaining part of the project, there's a market claim price and the model closes. So all the money goes back to the central bank, and that's why it has value. Okay, so here's a boring uh, central bank policy, right? I mean, here's N can be some number between lambda and one. Uh, and in principle, I would have to plot Y also for numbers below lambda, but they're irrelevant, so I'm always excluding them on these pictures here. So here's the liquidation policy. We just hold liquidation always constants, always at some Y star, let's say, and the interest rate is always zero. And that's a possible, possible policy in this environment. Okay. Let's just think first through equilibrium. Suppose I tell you what the policy of the central bank is. What, what then happens regarding prices and so forth, and what are the actions of the agents? Well, first of all, um, you know, we want to impose that the individual consumer spending is optimal. So given the policy, the, the patient agents optimally decide whether to shop in period one or shop in period two. Um, you know, the, 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 the liquidation and the nominal interest rate happens as per that policy that's, that's given here in this equilibrium definition, and the price levels have to clear the market. So if you write this down, then the top equation, that's just a quantity theory equation, the total amount of money spent in period one has to be equal to the nominal value of the goods sold. And you can, uh, you know, you can read that, I mean, you can read that equation various ways, right? I mean, either um, depending on N, and if, I mean, suppose you hold Y constant, just as one example, suppose you hold Y constant N adjust, then the price level would have to adjust. So that will be the case with flexible prices. But you can equally well read it as a fixed price scenario, sort of super Keynesian. If P1 is constant and N moves, then Y N has to move. And that's actually an interesting interpretation to which we'll come back later. And then you have something about period two. They have complicated formulas for period two, lots of black ink. I keep them on the slide. They turn out to be not so important. The only thing that's important about them is that, you know, stuff happens in period two and it's related to the nominal interest rate and it actually moves the price level in period two, but nominal interest rates don't do anything else here. So you might think that the problems we get, we get that I'm going to show in a moment, can be resolved through nominal interest rates. And the answer is no. The nominal interest rates only move the price here in period two. Okay, so watch what happens in period one. That's the key. All right. Then we can go to the real allocation. And for the real allocation, you're going to see that money is just a wheel. So if you just take the total uh, spending and divide by the price level, you find that the N agents just split the liquidated uh, portion among themselves. So X1 of N is just the total real liquidated portion, Y1 of N divided by N. And a similar formula holds for the period two. So the, uh, you know, the whole, all the CBDC and so forth, once we arrive here, doesn't matter. The real allocation is entirely driven by the real liquidation policy. And then, therefore, given n patients, agents spent in t equals 1 if x1 of n is bigger or equal than x2 of n, or maybe strictly bigger, depending on your taste. Okay, oops. So now, uh, oops, let's see. Uh, um, this is what's going on here. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. So now we say there are three competing objectives for the central bank. Right, so the central bank has a price stability objective. I should have ordered them differently because I'm going to talk about efficiency first, then about monetary trust. I'm going to talk about price stability last. But uh, so maybe maybe let, let should have reordered that list. Apologies. So efficiency is the central bank wants to get the efficient outcome that you see in Diamond Dipwick. We know what that is. Uh -huh. Clarifying question. And fiscal policy? Uh, There's no fiscal policy. How no. is interest, how does the central bank finance the interest payment? It's nominal interest. So it right? just prints money? It just creates money. Just yeah. Clarify, so you have you. a CBDC account, right. it says $100. You wait a period two, you have $200. Thank you. That's it. 
it's just it's just electronics. Uh, nothing happens to, to the, but, but the real stuff they can't change, right? The real technology is given. I mean, that's that's key. Yeah. So efficiency means optimal risk sharing. So you want the you want the diamond dipic solution. Monetary trust means you don't want uh, patient agents to spend period one. Right, and then uh, and then price stability. Well, price stability is price stability. The central bank likes to keep price stable. I have more. I started at twenty-seven. I have thirty minutes to talk. So sorry, huh? I'm not going to cut short here. I'm not playing that game. See, that's why these things are more useful than landlines. You know, now you know. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about efficiency first. The efficient outcome is. Um, you know, if you know that's an equilibrium, when well, if only the impatient agent spent in period one, you want that, right? Because that, that's needed for efficiency. And if indeed you liquidate exactly this amount y star, which is given by lambda times x one star, where x one star is the solution to the diamond dipic problem. So efficiency, very clear what that means here. But it's only at n equals lambda, right? For n different from lambda, once you have n different from lambda, you're no longer in the efficient outcome. Okay. Well, let's talk about objective three, monetary trust. So monetary trust here is a, you know, I mean, it's a run on the central bank, a spending run. So what does it mean? Well, it means the same thing as in Diamond Dipic, more than just the impatient agents go shopping in period one. You know, turn whatever they have into something else. So run occurs if n is bigger than lambda. That's our definition, seems very plausible. So you think uh, runs on central banks can't happen? Well, they certainly can happen here. And um, you know, what, how do you how do you how do you think about this? What you want as a central bank? Well, you want to implement policies, so you seek policies, perhaps, so that this won't happen, so that agents don't have an incentive. Patient agents have never an incentive to spend in period one. That would be monetary trust. Then people in period zero know, you know, from the get go, no such a scenario could never happen. Pardon? Well, pri I'm getting there, so I'm going to show you that in picture. But excellent question. That's that's important. That's going to be key. So the money run money loses its store value function. That's you know that's maybe the thing. The patients agents uh, purchase goods now and hoard them. The trust and monetary system evaporates. So that's simpler to temporary and pandemic stockouts, hyperinflation, currency crisis. It's different from a systemic bank run. Because in a systemic bank run, what people do is take their deposits and turn them to cash. They may not, they, I mean, they might go spending, but that's typically not what we think in a systemic bank run. Okay. So here's a picture. This is normal times. Period zero, you get some cash. And then if you're patient, impatient, period one, you go shopping, you get some toilet paper. Period two, you also get some toilet paper. And this here is a run on the currency. It, well, in this small market, didn't happen everywhere, but you're familiar with these pictures, right? So in period one, everybody goes shopping, you know, buys the toilet paper, and then there's a stock out in period two. So we have seen, we have certainly seen markets like that over and over again. So now imagine this happening on an economy-wide scale. All right, so implementing efficiency monetary uh, trust is, uh, it just means that you have to be at Y star for N equals lambda. And you have to make sure that your liquidation policy otherwise is such that the patient agents never want to go shopping in period one. So that there's an inequality, right? So X2 has to be larger than X1 for all N. And if you go through the mass, that means that your liquidation policy has to be smaller than this Y bar N. So Y bar N is how far you can go in terms of your liquidation policy if you want to maintain monetary trust. Okay, so if you don't go too far with your liquidation, that means... Um, you know, then, then you get efficiency and you get monetary trust. But run deterring policies now imply that the price level is going to be high in period one. What's the intuition here? Essentially, in order to have patient agents not want to go shopping in period one, you need to make sure that if there are lots of agents that go shopping, there aren't that many goods. And if there aren't that many goods, but lots of people are going shopping, lots of money chases few goods, and that means the price level goes up. So, so, so monetary trust and price stability are actually competing. They're, you know, they're, they're at opposite ends. You know. So let me show this in the picture, right? So, on the left you see you, you see the um, you see the liquidation policy, and the red line is this upper limit that I talked about. 
If you just liquidate always the same amount Y star, I mean, that would satisfy this run deterring limit. That would be, you know, establishing monetary trust. That's fine. But on the right, you see what happens with prices. If you keep Y always equal to Y star, you get a diagonal line in terms of the prices because you're just increasing the number of people spending without increasing the number of goods. Even for this run deterring policy, you see that the red line is rising. You might say that's fine. You know, you're just wanting deter runs. This is off equilibrium. Um, you know, it's just the central bank appears here is, you know, what, what you can think of it as saying, you know what, you know, if lots of people go shopping, you're not going to liquidate any goods. I mean, trust us. Right? You're not doing this. Well, you know, is this credible? Um, you know, is that what's going to happen? So if, if indeed more than lambda agents go shopping, would the central bank stick to this promise? If you like this, is Kutland Prescott the time consistency problem on top of its, you know, upside down, right? Kutland Prescott pointed out that the central bank would like to promise low inflation and then when push comes to shove, provide you with high inflation. So now we have all these mandates and, and treaties and so forth and what have you that say no central bank should stick to low inflation. So now here it's the upside, upside down, right? Here the central bank would, 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 would like to promise high inflation, but now they they're conservative central banks like to keep inflation low, so who knows? Maybe they're not going to do this. Go ahead. Yes, like, uh, is this price level that shuts us people buy? So just wondering when the price level that says low and people buy, does the price increase? Not if I hold at the low price level until the stock runs out, right? No, there's market clearing, right? The market there's a market clearing condition, right? There's no stock runs out here. Okay, they don't buy all cheap until the last uh, essentially until the stock is depleted. No, I mean, you know, there's a certain number of goods, certain number of people shopping, and there's a market, there's market clearing. So there's no queuing, right? I mean, that's the other thing about CBDC. We are, they're all sitting there electronically, you know, should I buy, should I buy, you know, coffee, yes or no, clunk, and they hit it, right? And uh, either the price level adjusts or the liquidation has to adjust at that time. If the price is constant, then liquidation has to adjust. But I, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll show you a version of what you have in mind, I think. So let, give me just hang on there. Okay, so price stability objective. You know, this is a question that always comes up in this talk. Why do we have a price stability objective for the central bank? And then, you know, I always throw up my hands in despair. I mean, there are 50 plus years of extensive literature on that topic. So pick your poison, you know, whatever is your favorite, uh, you know, validation for this. So it could be a traditional central bank objective. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. It could be the mandate or the treaty. It's in the Maastricht Treaty. Just look it up. Right? It could be that there's efficiency loss with higher inflation, so that's sort of a standard Keynesian agreement. You could put that in the model, we don't, I mean, mea culpa. Or you could just, you know, that may be the easiest motivation, that's sort of in, in line with what you're thinking, just assume that prices are fully sticky in period one. When you, go, when you go through all the plumbing on the asset side, you know, prices, for some reason, firms can't change price in period one, so they just have to match demand at, as these prices change. Okay. So if I go through the first one, you know, and then, then I kind of do the last one also as a, as a limit case, and imagine there's a price a stability objective. So the, the objective of the central bank is now a mix of two terms. The first one is just the standard you know, utility, expected utility that we have from Diamond Dipvix. So that's, that's written down here again. But the second portion is how far are you from some target price P bar? You want to be at some P bar, and if you're away from that in period one, you know, then the central bankers feel uncomfortable. Okay, so now we want to think about the time consistent or sub perfect equilibrium. You see N, central bank sees N, and then says, oh, you know, now let's maximize this objective too, and that gives the Y N. And in period zero, everybody understands this, and so what's the equilibrium? Okay. And um, now, you, so, so a piece of notation, P1 star is going to be M divided by X1 star, so if the so, so one particular interesting price target will be the one will be the price that comes about if you're trying to implement the the efficient solution. You know, and M is just a scaling parameter here, so M is not that important. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So this is a somewhat convoluted plot, but here you're seeing the uh, liquidation policies, right? So if I make alpha lower and lower, you you start liquidating more and more. So this blue curve kind of shifts upward on the left. It shifts upward because you're trying to put more goods on the table as lots of money is chasing goods if you have a price stability objective. And you can see that sort of the top blue line then goes through, you know, pierces through my red, you know, monetary trust limit that I had before. Consequently, what you see with prices, prices are falling and now they're falling also eventually through the, you know, through the, the price increase that will be necessary with the, with the monetary, with the uh, run deterrent policy. 
Okay, so now here the price stability goal is p bar equal p1 star. So at n equals lambda, you always get efficiency. So that's great. And it's and if you don't put much emphasis on price, it's still run deterring. That's fine. But if you get to near zero, now the subcamp perfect liquidation policy gives rise to runs, and you no longer have monetary trust. So if you push this to the limit, if you put alpha all the way to zero, and so this is sort of a version of what you have in mind, right? Then uh, uh, then then price are going to be sticky, sticky, sticky until you run out of goods, and then they're going to move, right? So that's that's maybe another way of thinking about this, right? So this this also we call this partial price stability also rises if price are fully sticky, unless all is sold and price just have to adjust. You know, if you get, you know, it's not that it's not that there's a stock out. It's just that all the goods are on the table, and at that point, you know, firms firms just pay whatever price to adjust prices. So, if you like sticky price stories more than that picture is for you. If you like the, if you like the traditional objective than the previous picture and taking the limit here is also for you. So, so pick what you want. So, so again, no monetary trust. All right. Well, how about voiding runs? Well, you could lower that price target. Actually, sorry, you could raise that price target that you have in mind, right? And so that's this scenario here. So let's just not be so ambitious, right? And, and it's fine, right? If the price target in period one is, is higher and everybody in centers in period zero, you know, and, you know that's, that's not inflation, right? It's, you know, it's just, it's just uh, you know, that's just scaling. And you can keep price more stable and now, how do you do this, right? Having a higher price level throughout, well, you just liquidate less throughout, right? And that's what you see with the green line here. The green line shifts down. Now you're below the red line, so that's great. So you raise the price stability target, and you could compute the smallest one here so that the subgame liquidation policy is run deterring for every subgame and bigger than lambda, maybe except for n equals one. But now you no longer have efficiency. If I push this all to the limit, then that's the solution here. So that. That would be true for fully sticky prices unconditionally, no matter what, if they're always sticky, then that's a scenario. So this is, this is also actually how we think about central banks typically, right? That will be a scenario where central banks only invest in storage technology, government bonds. It's inefficient, right? If CBDC replaces bank deposits, that's not where you want to be. Okay, so we get the trilemma three, no efficiency. Ways out. Well, why not change the money supply in T equals one? So people think of that as an interest rate policy, but not true because you have to change the money supply, how much money people hold, depending on circumstances that moment. All right. And, and you can do the equation there in four, right? You could say, well, the M that you have on your CBDC account is going to be a function of how much people want to spend. And then, you know, sure, you can. When given some liquidation policy, let's say holding y equal to y star and the price level equal to p bar, you can figure out what that m of n is. So one way to think about this is, sure, let's have that as a CBDC, CBDC design. So that's what the discussant mentioned. The way I like to think of this, this might be pretty catastrophic. If you, if you are in a situation where you tell people, you know what, everyone wants to go shopping, you know, half of your account you can't spend anymore. I'm sorry. And you have to keep it. You know, we thought it was liquid cash. It's no longer liquid. We freeze it. I mean, I think you would have a revolution on your hand, right? So we call this SOS. So spending or spendability. But, uh, but nothing in the model says you can't do this. In the model, it's perfectly fine. Okay. The other possibility is sort of this Jacqueline-inspired solution, right? So Jacqueline proposed to sell equity. In, in, in the bank, right? Or in, in, now, you're not selling equity in the, in the physical assets, you're selling, selling equity in the nominal assets, as it were, right? So I'm, I'm going to call these things bonds because they tick like bonds, walk like bonds, but they're the Jacqueline equity, right? And so you're just giving agents uh, short maturity equity or bond, whatever you want to prefer to call it, that pays off a certain amount of liquidity in, in period one, and a, shon, a long maturity bond that pays off liquidity in period two. Agents trade these bonds in T equals one, and now if you have a liquidation policy that holds Y n equals to Y star, it will be efficient financial uh, price uh, stable and price stable. Um, if you want to do the sub-game policy, perfect policy, things become a little bit more subtle, and then you also have to open a uh, discount window at the central bank where people can borrow against the long-term bond if, you, if they need to at the right interest rate. So um, that, that, work, that part we have to fully work out. Anyways, so conclusion, in the normal banking model for central bank and the central bank digital currency, central bank can always deliver its nominal obligations. So in that sense, they can't be run. But spending months can still happen. And because of that, we get a CBDC trilemma that out of these three objectives, you can only accomplish two. 
and it's five seconds to 57, so I'm on time. So, so one question, Richard, right? I mean, obviously it's an outlier what's happening today with the supply chain, Russia, Ukraine, and all that. If you leave that aside, aren't AI machine learning models supposed to make the economic reorder quantity work? Make the what? The economic reorder model, right, for goods and services. Yeah. And then, because it's a global market, the theory of competitive advantage would also move goods into our country, right? I mean, would that, or I mean, are we dismissing those? I mean, uh, if I'm running a company, yeah. and let's say if these Russia, Ukraine, mm -hmm, global mm -hmm, COVID, mm -hmm. all this was mm -hmm. not there, my economic order quantity would tell me my my shelves are not getting stocked, which will have a kick-on effect on the supply chain and stuff would happen, maybe a few days later, but are, are we kind of depicting the current situation of well, outlier a little too much? I, I don't know. I mean, a, I mean, you would have sort of a deep pocket outside person willing to borrow and lend goods against CBDC, I assume that that's what you're saying, right? And then Yeah, that and, and also then, the uh, shelf stocking, right? I mean, then, the, the uh, shelf stocking you know, problem wouldn't exist. So if there's you know, if there's another agent that has lots of resources, but then you have a, you know, I mean, that's a, you know, I mean, here the, I mean, but, but that's true with bank runs too, right? I mean, in some ways you could say, well, why don't we have an outside investor who just, when the depositors come and the bank no, is Warren is Buffett solvent, comes later, remember, when he comes right? in I mean, later, a, not right? at the if, same if, time. If the bank is solvent, why, why doesn't some outside investor come in, you know, some Warren Buffett and just pays off the depositor and, and then uh, takes the assets and, you know, no, right. He, I mean, he doesn't come in here's, a, it's too here's a close economy, so that's yeah, why yeah, yeah. you know it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's you know. Can okay. I ask one question quickly? But but thanks. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. I. You know. I uh, so maybe you answered the question. So I was wondering. So when you have a run, it's a run on consumption goods, no? If I understood correctly, what do you, what happens if you had like an alternative store of value, let's say Bitcoin? I mean, since we are in uh, or gold. Could you get a run on this alternative uh, store of value and still get? Uh... No, I mean, um, I, I, I mean, we call a run if there's a run on goods, right? Because that's the only one that that uh, troubles the central bank, right? I mean, if you have, um, in, in fact, in the paper we go also through possibility that there's a competing private banking system and the bank deposits there, and I mean, you could potentially go from the CBDC and the deposit and back into CBDC, um, but it's. But you know that, that that doesn't change this picture, right? And that, that's sort of like a systemic bank run. So if you just change one nominal obligation for another one, that wouldn't do so anything. I yet. was wondering if you introduce this alternative uh, store of value, would the mechanism change, or is it another model? Or no, you still owe the CBDC back to the cent. I mean, yeah, um, I mean, because the you know if you store it in value, it doesn't become relevant for pricing, right? So. Uh, what matters for pricing is simply how many, how many agents spend in period one. Now, it's true you could also call that a run if everybody turns the CBDC into Bitcoin and then repays the central bank because, you know, uh, and, then, and then turns Bitcoin back. I mean, actually, the question is would, would then buy the Bitcoin period too, but leaving that aside for the moment, turning that back into CBDC money. But that's not, that's a different type of run. That's a nominal run or systemic bank run that we don't consider here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just have a comment, which is just, I think there's like a really cool aspect of your paper, which you in some ways undersell, which is the fact that in this context, the, the bank does have an ability to avoid bank runs, uh, uh, albeit by violating price stability. But, but if you think about the Diamond and Dibbig paper, then that's in real terms. And they yes. mentioned in their second proposition that you can avoid bank runs by doing taxes and real goods after the fact. So which of course violates sequential service. But essentially what is really, I think, needed in your model is that it's a, it's, everything's in nominal terms, uh, but you essentially is, achieve the same thing uh, through an inflation tax. Right. So you're essentially uh, 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 altering the, yeah, by, 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 by changing the money supply, you're altering the prices of goods in, in, in a way that can punish the people that, that, that withdraw when yeah. they shouldn't. No. So I, I think mm -hmm. that's just a really sort of cool aspect of the model. And the, the fact that that, of course, violates price stability, which, which makes it be inserted into your trilemma. But I think that's a really uh, interesting aspect of your model. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate it. And, and, and I agree with that. Uh, that point, in some ways, has been made before by Skyer, right? So because it's true that if you have a nominal banking model, people just don't turn deposits into real goods. They turn deposits into cash, right? If this happens on an economy-wide scale, 
then you have lots of cash floating around. Then the question comes on what happens with, what happens with cash. If they start to go spending, and that's sort of back to your question, I, mean, I totally agree, right? What happens in a systemic bank run and people turn banks, you know, deposits into cash? If they go spending, then we have a problem with the price level. If they don't go spending, everything is fine. Um, very quick. That was a great comment. Hmm? That was a great comment by Rod. Yeah, it was, a, it was, a, <laughs> it was a good, you know, happy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, two quick questions. One is on the credibility issue of suspending uh, redemptions. You, you asked the question rhetorically, do you think that the central bank would have that commitment power? Well, since we're in this conference, I mean, what, what if we uh, power this redemption policy through smart contracts that kind of you could build in the commitment power, pro, just programming in? That's one question. Yeah. Second question is on this. Eh, I like the I like the trilemma thing there, but as a central banker, you know, uh, the the price level stability I didn't interpret as long run. You know, we're, we're willing to sacrifice short run variability to even threaten it to achieve stability. So. I don't know if it's like a violation of the mandate, but. Yeah, I mean, tell that to Jeremy then, Powell right now. Yeah. 8% uh, inflation, who cares, you know. I get that you want the trilemma, so. <laughs> no, I, I think inflation, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at the inflation response now, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's it's a disaster. For, I mean, you know, it's a disaster. It's 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 perceived as a disaster. I, I think it's, I think that's a very short run phenomenon. So I <laughs> let me just slightly disagree there. But I'm, I'm, you know, it's true. We are very negative here on these kinds of things. Um, maybe they are more positive, right? Because there will be spending limits. You could impose spending limits, for example. You could impose account limits, and that's something that, that is very much talked about in terms of the design feature. That's fair. So we also had a discussion. Copia recently said, "Well, that that suggests we should that have that as a design feature." Many central banks are indeed talking about it. I totally agree. I guess I'm. Uh, I just want to point out that. We want to be a little bit careful in, in thinking this is uh, nirvana because, uh, I mean, let's take the account limits on CBDC, right? What happens if, there's, if suddenly there's a bank going under and people want to, in panic, take their, take their amounts out and put them on their CBDC accounts and you tell them, no, there's a limit, you can't do that, right? Then, uh, and there's no cash. I mean, or you tell people in a, in a, in a, in a situation where they're all a little panicky, where there's another pandemic, they now want to go shopping, and they, they want to buy all this toilet paper and tell them, you know what, the cash that you have on your bank account, we just freeze it, you can't spend it. Um, it's true in the model that's possible. I just warn that, you know, once you think through these policies, there may be, you might have a revolution on your hand and there's a trade-off there. Now, maybe if the, if this, maybe there's a way of announcing this in a way that the public would fully understand this and appreciate that solution, but it's at least something that needs to be thought through very carefully before we had that direction. That's all I'm saying. It's possible to implement it, I agree. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for all the questions.